This is Overdrive for this Tuesday afternoon. I'm Aaron Karolnik and for Brian Hayes with my friends Mike DiStefano and Dave Feschuk from the Toronto Star, a beloved trio here for the next three hours on TSN 1050 and TSN 2. Why are you chuckling, Michael? I just, I think you, uh, beloved trio, we'll see what happens with our mentions in the next hour. Oh, so so you think I was being sarcastic with my... No, not at all. Yes. Not at all. Maybe a little bit. And I will concede some of the reaction yesterday to my hosting of the show. Listen, maybe maybe it wasn't the finest performance. I did my best. The reaction, eh, a little bit mixed from the Overdrive Reddit community. Some people on Twitter, they love the traditional trio of Overdrive. What we have today, I think, will be truly exceptional. We've got an amazing show. Great show booked by our man Chris Horvat. Kelly McCrimmon, the GM of the Vegas Golden Knights, will be with yes. us in about 30 minutes. Mike Johnson. TSN hockey analyst just after five o'clock, Randy Mueller, crazy happenings in the NFL the last couple of days, almost a billion dollars in commitments. We have some great stuff to get to. We're not the beloved trio, but what we are starts with B. We are the B trio. Yeah, true. That's a good point. It's a good point. The B but, team. But there will be some A performances today. That I guarantee. That well, I guarantee. Look, I, I'm looking forward to getting Kelly McCrimmon online because... What this guy's been able to do with the Golden Knights and the performance that he put on over the course of the last week of the trade deadline is something to behold. Uh, like it's, oh, it's outstanding wow. what he did. And like nice. I just want to get into the mindset of, of Kelly McCrimmon because all we hear over the course of the last few years is how difficult it is to make moves, how difficult it is to trade in this you know cap era. And all of a sudden, Kelly McCrimmon says, I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> yeah. This isn't easy. I, I'm doing this every six months. We're making blockbuster deals. And just to get, you know... A little bit of insight on his philosophy of team building. I mean, I, I think it's going to be great. I'm, I'm looking forward to that chat at 4.30. Yeah, it's it's just so uncommon, right, where the preponderance of their moves, the significant ones, are made in season. And then the off season, they look at the roster and be like, all right, this is how we're going to do things. And then we'll clean out things that we kind of made a mess of during the season with regards to our salary cap structure. That's the off season. But during the season, we are pedal to the metal, full throttle. They bring in Mantha. They bring yeah. in Hannafin. And the shocker of the day on Friday, Thomas Hurdle, right at 3 o'clock. That's uh, something to behold. I think when you consider here in Toronto how, you know, everybody out west, I think the majority of the contenders made significant moves. Colorado, Edmonton, the, Go- the Golden Knights. I mean, if the list goes on and on. Winnipeg Jets, we see Tyler Dallas, And Dallas Tanev. makes a move. They bring in Chris Tanev. And out east, and I mean, I don't think this is like exclusive to the Toronto Maple Leafs at all. I mean, Florida, and they bring in Tarasenko, which is fine. Mm-hmm. Not a huge move. Boston's very quiet. The Rangers bring in Wenberg. We know Carolina was probably the most active with regards to the guys they brought in. Jake Gensel likely to make his debut tonight. But the arms race out west... I wonder how much that played into how aggressive the Golden Knights were on the deadline week. Yeah, there's something to that. I mean, the West is tough. and But I also think with the Golden Knights, like they just sort of have this unique ruthlessness to them that they've established. I mean, you think about this city and how we've been told by the many executives that have run the Maple Leafs over the past, go back as many years as you want to go back, about how hard it is to win and how tough the league is and how difficult it is to make trades. Al's brother, to your point, um, these guys, the golden Knights have been around for less time in this league than Marner and Matthews. Let's <laughs> yeah. like, let's not forget that. Yeah. Marner and Matthews have been around longer than the golden Knights. And the golden Knights have won a cup. They've been to another conference final. All they've done is run circles around their competitors in both the executive suite and largely on the ice. And it is, it's absolutely amazing. And I think it speaks to like, you know, as much as you say, it may be an arms race, but it's, it's just, it's just what they do. Like they're, they're so singularly focused. I don't think they're worried about what everybody else is doing. Well, if you look at last year's deadline, the arms race was in the East and the Leafs were a big part of it. The yep. O'Reilly deal, Luke Shen, Jake McCabe, it goes on. The Rangers made some huge moves, Patrick Kane yeah, and Tarasenko. Man. I mean, amongst other teams, but for whatever reason, it's all out West. And I don't know if that speaks to the teams in the West maybe feeling inadequate relative to their opposition. I don't think that's necessarily fair. I think it's almost cyclical in that, you know, one year, a bunch of teams in one conference trade first round picks and prospects. And the next year, maybe they're not so willing to do so. And it was this year where the West 
really brought the heat at the I, deadline. I think it comes down to you look at how many teams in the West feel that they can win this year. And there's a lot of them. Like almost every single sure. team out there has an opportunity, whether it's Edmonton, Vegas, Colorado, Dallas, you know, the list goes on and on. Winnipeg, they made a couple of big moves too. I think they all feel like they can win. And when you see everyone else bolstering their lineup, you think to yourself, okay, well now, you know, it's it's shrunk a little bit. We got to go. We got to make sure that our odds swing in our favor by adding it to Foley or going out and now adding Tomash Hurdle on top of the Hannafin and the Anthony Mantha deal. So I think it's just, you know, out West, it's just you've got some really good teams and teams that are very well built from top to bottom, teams that got four lines, big, deep defense, and, and you've got some good goaltending out there as well. So for me, I look at it and it's just, those are the teams that feel they can win. Therefore, they're making those moves to try and get them over the hump. Now, I think here in Toronto, does Brad Tree Living and the Maple Leafs, do they believe they can win? Yeah, I, I think they think they can. They I'll, have to. Yes. And, like, and of course, they're going to come out and say, yes, we are looking at our core players, which is exactly what Tree Living did here on this very show on Friday. We're looking at our core players to step up and perform in the biggest moments. And, I mean, you look at the way the Maple Leafs played in the first round last year against Tampa. Matthews had nine points, five goals. Mm-hmm. Marner was well over a point a game. John Tavares scores the game-winning goal in Game 6, so they stepped up, and we know how it went in the second round against Florida, where it was essentially a ghost town as far as the top players go. But Ilya Labushkin's a Maple Leaf. Joel Edmondson's a Maple Leaf. He made his debut on Saturday playing almost 20 minutes. And we know Colin Dewar's a Maple Leaf as well. He's a depth forward to kill some penalties. But I don't think the Leafs really altered their trajectory as far as what they can do in the postseason. But I don't know if there really was a move that was going to allow them to do so. Like, let's say they trade for Noah Hannafin, Mm -hmm. right? Or they trade for Chris Tanev. How much better are the Leafs using their assets to make those moves as opposed to Labushkin and Edmondson? It's a question that we have really no answer to. But what I would say is that heading into the deadline, let's say two weeks out, it was pretty obvious the Maple Leafs had a couple of big holes. On the right side of their D, they needed a top four defenseman. And yeah. I think they needed someone to play down the middle, a more significant role than Colin Dewar could. And was that option out there for Brad Tree Living? We'll never know. He may never tell. But I think they kind of band-aided over some of their holes, some of their, you know, the the, Absolutely. the, the, the parts of their roster that you kind of look at. It's not game changers, but I you go back to what Tree Living said, and he's absolutely right. But I do think this is applicable to every team in the National Hockey League. Your best players need to be your best players. Yes. When Chicago was winning those cups, when LA was winning those cups, when Pittsburgh was winning those cups, it wasn't the third and the fourth liners. Maybe you can look at a Tampa with Barkley, Gaudreau, and and that whole run that with a third line. But yeah, Matthews and Marner and Tavares and Nylander and Riley, they're going to need to be the least best players. And it didn't really matter who they were going to get at the deadline. It was always going to be the case. Yeah, I mean, like that, a hundred percent. That's going to be to be the case. The only player that would have been worth going out and getting. We've had this conversation. For weeks now, because Tana was the guy who went off the board first. He was that first domino to fall. And the second he was gone, it's like, well, now the options aren't really, it's very limited, especially when it comes to filling the hole of the top four right side. Like Labushin came in and it was like, okay, well, he's like a third pair type of player. He's going to get more minutes. He's going to end up playing alongside Morgan Riley, we think. Uh, based on how things have shaken out so far. And then they went and got Joel Edmondson. It's in a perfect world, he was a right shot. But again, another guy where it's like, okay, he's like a five. You know, like he's not a bona fide four. And he is more comfortable on the left side than on the right side. And we get into another situation where it's, you got five left shot defensemen on your blue line. And then the lone right shot is Timothy Lilligren, who is questionable at best. Struggling. Struggling uh, to, to maybe even be a game one member of this roster. Yeah. Right? And, and now I mean, it's okay. So Labushkin's your only other well, guy. Well, and that's, that's the scary thing here is that, you know, you understand, I think the statement that tree living made in a lot of ways was a statement for the future of what he sees an ideal defense core being. And he sees it being a lot bigger than what Kyle Dubis yeah. saw it as. Right. So he, he acquires both Labushkin and, and, Edmondson, they're both big guys, and they're both not afraid to take a chunk out of somebody in front of the net. We had, you know, do you see do you see a longer term future for those guys here if things go well over the next three months? Well, hang on, let's see how things go. Well, yeah. uh, yes, of course. <laughs> if they, if <laughs> things I mean, go well over the next three months, has not always panned out particularly well for the yeah. Maple Leafs, as you know, Al's brother. But yeah, look, I think, but I also think like, you know, for tree living, it's you know, Tanev would have been the guy. Right, but there was obviously baggage between Tree Living and his former team out in Calgary. It seemed like there was a 
that was maybe a, a hindrance to making a, a fair deal. And, and I, but I also think like, you have to think about it in, in tree living's mind. He clearly is looking at this team going, I don't like the way it's built. Like I didn't build it. Right. Kyle Dubas built it. So what's the best course of action for me? But the best course of action for me is to put it on them and say, you guys show me what you can do. I don't necessarily, you know, this is not how I would build a team. I'm starting to put an imprint on how I like a team built, but I can't put that imprint on completely. He said it right before the trade deadline. I cannot address all the things that need to be addressed between now and the trade deadline, which was not exactly a, you know, a rousing, a rousing endorsement of what he has in front of him. But I do think that's not a bad approach for a new GM in town to say, look, I don't necessarily believe in the way this team is built. So you guys go out there and show me that I'm wrong. Yeah, and, and going back to the relativity, East versus West, and I think the Rangers, yeah, that Wenberg, that's a decent pickup. And you consider what Boston did. They may, perhaps they tried to move Allmark to the Kings and bring in uh, something different up front, but there wasn't that massive transformational trade beyond Gensel, you could argue, and maybe Kuznetsov, heading to Carolina in the East. So I think for the Leafs, and I do wonder, let's just say Boston makes a massive move on Tuesday or the Florida Panthers make some massive move beyond Tarasenko on Monday, is Trita Living looking at that? It's like, okay, well, our direct competition is stepping up and making significant additions to their team. Is this something we need to answer for? And that's kind of going back to what Vegas has done here in the last week with Mantha and Hannafin and Thomas Hurdle, where I can guarantee you all these, it's an arms race. Yeah. And you're looking at it, and all of these top teams at West were making huge moves that are bolstering their rosters. It was almost incumbent on those general managers to answer because if they don't, I'm sure their fan bases and media are like um, Edmonton went out and yeah, got they, it. Yeah, they got center. better. Right. You didn't. You didn't. So right? for the league, yeah. I think it's more defensible for Tree Living to kind of address around the edges as opposed to, all right, we'll give up the first round pick for Tanavin or for, excuse me, for Tanavin. That's the uh, Tana well, yeah, Hannafin <laughs> combination. Right. I think that's something they would have done, but it's uh, I, th I just don't think it was as pressurized an environment simply because of how it went East versus West. Well, it's not a pressurized environment because it's not on Brad Tree Living. If this team fails, no one's going to blame Brad Tree Living. I won't. How can you? I mean, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of the Shanna plan. I mean, Brent, Brendan Shanahan has been here 10 years next month. I mean, that's I think that's where the blame is going to be pointed if this team fails yet again in, in the playoffs. And it's on the players, too. You're going to be pointing at the guys who are in year eight. And, you know, we'll see, depending on how they do, may or may not have any playoff success of any substantial merit on their resumes at the end of this season. So, you know, we'll see. But to your point about we don't know what was out there or there wasn't a deal out there, did anybody know there was a Thomas Hurdle deal out there for the Vegas Golden Knights? Kelly no. McCrimmon knew. No, that. that's yeah, what I mean. Yeah. Like, nobody was talking about a Thomas Hurdle deal. So I always think it's a little bit dangerous to say there wasn't a deal out there. There's deals for aggressive GMs. Kelly McCrimmon just proved that. If you want to be aggressive, if you think you need something, you got to go out there and get it. You don't, you don't look at the TSN trade bait board and wonder, what are the insiders saying I should do? <laughs> you go out there and do what real GMs do. You make an aggressive move. So on that front, I mean, John Klingberg gets hurt, what, mid-November, late November? And from then on, I mean, it wasn't like this happened last week where Trey Living's like, oh, look, we have four-plus million dollars in LTIR space to use on Klingberg, who's going to have a, a hip, hip procedure, and we won't see him again this season. Oh, Matt Murray, LTIR, Jake Muzzin's LTIR, the Leafs are they have the highest projected salary cap space of any team in the NHL, including the Vegas Golden Knights, which I actually find quite comical considering everyone's so up in arms about <laughs> Vegas and how they're circumventing the salary cap, the spirit of the rules. When in fact, it's the Leafs who are actually taking advantage of the rules more so than anybody. Now, how are they taking advantage of it relative to Vegas? And I would argue, well, I mean, Edmondson, Labushkin, and Dewar versus Mantha and Hannafin yeah. and Thomas Hurdle. Hurdle. And, you know, you get Mark Stone back in, in game one. We are, we're all presuming, and I'm sure if we were to ask Kelly McCrimmon in 15 minutes, hey, is Stone back? He'll be like, I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> we'll find well. out. But I, th hope. I think if I was a betting man, and you guys know that I am, Mark Stone playing game one in the playoffs, I believe, Probably. with no inside information at all, I have not been privy to the lacerated spleen MRIs. Do you get MRIs on spleens? I, I don't actually don't know. I have no clue. Maybe, maybe, maybe a CAT scan. I don't know. But uh, maybe it's just maybe like not. if you if you like there's no blood coming out yeah. of your orifices, you're good. I, I don't know, but I think there's a pretty good chance Stone's back, and then you know Hurdle comes back, and Hannafin's there, and I think Hurdle's ex supposed to come back before the season's over. Yes, right? like McCurman came out and said, yeah, I should next few weeks we should get a look at him. 
to go back to the Maple Leafs, the one thing that I do question and I'm curious about is why did Brad Tree Living give up extra assets to get the salary retention if he didn't end up using it? Well, like I, he got an extra I, 50% on Edmondson, yes. 50% on Labushkin, and gave up additional draft draft assets to make that happen, but then never actually followed through to make use of it. Therefore, those are wasted assets. So you could look at it that way. I think you could also look at it the Leafs keep Noah Gregor on their roster, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe Ryan Reeves on their roster, or maybe I guess they did lose Legacy to Anaheim, but you're like you can use to you can use your salary cap space to carry extra players, or you can go down to the the bones, right? And the Leafs choose for the the former as opposed to the latter. So if the Leafs were to use that salary cap space on a singular player, guys like Gregor might be out the door, mm-hmm. and maybe other depth defensemen uh, who you couldn't keep on the roster otherwise. I think that would be the logic behind it. Give, and Kelly, if you're Kelly upgrading Keith, on those players, does it really well, matter? You're, you're, well, you're right, but I think depth is important, right? Like let's look at the Leafs' defense. Heading into this, but if game you're losing Gregor, you're, it's because you've brought in somebody better, someone yeah, else. But I, I don't know if it's like a one for one transaction. Like you might need to, I mean, I don't know, f- finagle it in a certain way. I'm far from a Brandon Prinham <laughs> salary cap expert, right? But you consider where the Leafs' D is heading into Thursday's game against Philadelphia, and we saw in practice Jake McCabe got a maintenance day, but he'll be playing with TJ Brody. We know Morgan Riley and Ilya Labouche can be playing together. I presume Edmondson and Lilligren will get another look together. Yeah. Is that the playoff D that you see heading into game one? Like I, I would be hard pressed to imagine Simone Benoit finds his way back in there somewhere, Dave. Like wow. how do you see it? I mean, Timothy Timothy Lilligren's on a short leash. Very much. Right? So. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, the, I mean Sheldon Keefe essentially said it. On Saturday night, oh, I said he was all. sick to his stomach to to hold yeah. out Simon Benoit, which means he would have preferred to have Benoit in the lineup. And, but unfortunately, Lilligren happens to shoot right. That's the thing. Like, when when the best thing you could say about a guy is that his stick curves the right way, <laughs> it's not exactly a ringing endorsement no, of your faith very in that man. No. And let's not let, let's face it. Like I, Timothy Lilligren's taking a hard ride in this town, but he was a scratch in Game One of the playoffs against Tampa last year too, right? Like he was not on the list. Yeah, because you can't trust him. Because he maybe can't trust himself. I think it is you. You, you t- ask around that league; it seems like it's a confidence issue at times. He he is going to be somebody that I will like over the next eighteen games. This this final stretch, he is someone who you definitely have to put a bit of a, a magnifying glass on and see. All right, how is this guy going to perform? Because I I could hear the argument that perhaps you know the rumors have been swirling. Could he be included in some deals? They want to bring in extra right shot defensemen to bulk up that side. I'm sure it impacted him at some point mentally, and maybe that impacted how he was playing on the ice. Now that's behind him. He has a chance to solidify himself a spot in this in this roster in this lineup, but he's got to do that by playing well the next 18 games and try and earn that trust now from Sheldon Keith. We've seen him at his height. He is definitely a good defenseman. Like we saw him play for that five game stretch news with TJ Brody. That was a formidable pair. Seven points in those five games. He was great. He was doing his thing. And we've seen at times even last year where I remember having a conversation with Johnny and he'll join us at five o'clock. There was times last season where it was, man, this guy might be a top four guy. He might solidify himself as a top four defenseman with this team. And then for whatever reason, he ends up losing confidence and then he kind of falls out of it. A couple bad mistakes, bad turnovers. And then ultimately what happened against Boston, you see him get out, worked and out, maneuvered in front of the net. And all of a sudden, you don't feel as great about him. But can he show us over the next 18 games that he can play with a little jam, that he can clear out the net, that he can move the puck, which is going to be another big asset for him, his ability to transport it up to the forwards. That's really what he's there to do, more so than the righty-lefty. It's it's the transporting the puck thing. Um, but that's what he's got to be able to prove to Sheldon Keith that that's worth keeping in a lineup over what Simo Benoit gives you in just a little bit more jam. And I am very curious, and I wonder if Sheldon Keefe would answer this in a candid moment, like how they would plan to deploy against Matthew Kachuk and Sam Reinhardt or David Pasternak, who has just been a oh, leaf killer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, is it Brody and McCabe? Is it Riley Labushkin going up against them? Well, the scary thing is Brody's taking a step back this year, too. Like, his, his number. Especially when he's been right. on the right side. Yeah. The left side, I think he's been a lot more. Well, yeah, that, uh, it stood expect. out, right? When he, yeah. when he had that five-game stretch on the left side when Riley was out, it did stand out that he was much more effective and much more at ease. And that's a good thing. But, look, the best thing they can hope for here, like, when it comes to Lilligren, is that Joel Edmondson is somehow like the Timothy Lilligren whisperer, right? Like he, all of his strengths, like Edmondson, to put it in the old Babcock terms, like Edmondson knows where to stand, right? Yes. Like, and unlike Lilligren, who can, 
it's amazing to me. Like Lilligren can be in front of the net in the right position, <laughs> standing there, and yet an opposing player can just walk right in, score a goal, and Timothy Lilligren just sort of watches it happen, right? Like Edmondson's like the opposite of that. Edmondson will make you know that you are occupying real estate yeah. in front of his goaltender, yeah. right? So so maybe there'll be some, you know, by osmosis or just by yelling at the guy, hey, do this, do that. I'm a veteran, you're not. I've won a Stanley Cup, you haven't. This is how it's done. I don't know how much of that can go on in the short period of time we're talking about here between now and, you know, the middle of next month. But I think they got to hope for that. You know, that's probably a big part of why Edmondson's in the fold here. He's a, he's a good yeah. locker room guy, and he's obviously a good guy on the ice. What I do like about the way that the D pairings are constructed currently, and, and again, there's I guarantee you these are going to change an abundance of times in the next 18 games. But if you look at the way it is constructed right now, heading into this game against Philly, you have one guy on each pairing who plays tough, mean, physical hockey in front of the defense, right? You've got Jake McCabe, who can clear out the front of the net. Ilya Labushkin has proven that he can do that. And now, obviously, Joel Edmondson on the third pair alongside Timothy Lilligren. So at least you do have one guy on each pairing now that is capable of doing that. When you had Riley and, and Brody together, neither were really too strong when it came to, to doing stuff like that. You had Benoit and you had uh, McCabe doing both of those were able to do it. But then when you had, let's say, Lilligren or Lagasin, you know, when Gio was out, you didn't really have that either. Now there's at least some strength and balance in the D pairs, like literal strength when it comes to guys who can clear out the net front. That is Michael DiStefano. That's Dave Festrek from the Toronto Star. I am Aaron Karolnik. You are listening to Overdrive, TSN 1050, and TSN 2 with Kelly McCrimmon, the Vegas Golden Knights general manager, standing by. Overdrive continues here on TSN 1050. You're watching on TSN 2. Karolnik, Festchuk, and DiStefano in for the usual trio. A lot of positive responses online for our opening segment, fellas. That's a, it's a good start. It's a good start. We're turning it around. We're Don't get too around. cocky. It's true. It's Don't true. get too okay. cocky. It's okay. I will say the one person who did remark that need a host who actually listens is a reference to yesterday when we had Chris Rose on, and I asked him some question about Justin Fields, who remains without a starting yeah. position anywhere and in the NFL. not a lot of landing spots left. Does not appear to be the case, and he's like, ah, oh, yeah, this team, this team, Vegas, not in the mix, and I'm like, what about Vegas? Oh, no. Yeah, I was a, did I say Rafalski moment oh, by yours no. truly. no. Might have been my first on radio as well, so first time for everything, I suppose. That's okay. What are you going to do? Pick yourself up. Do? You'll be all right. Yes, dust, dust it off, Dave, and we're going to... Happens to the best be, of us, pal. That's I right. mean, the Rafalski moment was born on this very show. Mm -hmm. So I think it's fitting that the first one you have is on this show. Did Shout I out say to Rafalski? Shout out to there Brian Rafalski, a quality defenseman for many years in the National oh, Hockey yeah. League. I'm oh, sure yeah. if he heard like that what his, his name is his last with? name is a reference on a Toronto based radio show associated with not listening properly <laughs> and asking the same question to a guest. I wonder what his reaction would be. I think probably positive. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's know. an honor, right? People, Did I say... People remember your name. <laughs> Rafalski. Even if maybe he <laughs> forgot his name. Briefly. Yeah, that's uh, that's good stuff. Anyways, Kelly McCrimmon, the Golden Knights general manager, will join us in just a moment. Uh, we have Mike Johnson coming up as well. Vegas in action tonight. They're taking on the Seattle Kraken. Mm. They did win on Saturday night, 5-3, to three in their first, in their first post-trade deadline activity. But, I mean, this is far mm. from a complete Vegas roster, right? Hurdle's not yeah. yet returned. We're anticipating perhaps Mark Stone makes his return to the lineup later in the season. And you add those two individuals into what is already a really quality team. Noah Hannafin on the back end. Aiden Hill could, as an argument, to be the Conn Smythe trophy guy. I mean, after last year, yeah. went to Marsh or so, but Aiden Hill was right there with him. That's going to be a formidable foe down the stretch into the playoffs. Oh, I mean, it's amazing to me. You talk about, you know, Brad Tree Living said it before the deadline that you can't have enough defensemen. And uh, these guys go out and... They have too many. They've got too many. <laughs> Golden Knights should hook oh, the Leafs up with somebody. I, I can I never have so. too many defensemen. I, I, so. I bet the guy on the line would agree with that. Yes, yeah, so he is the general manager of the Vegas, Vegas Golden Knights, the reigning Stanley Cup champion. It is Kelly McCrimmon with us here on Overdrive. Good afternoon, sir. How you doing? Uh, doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. It is our pleasure. Now, you don't win the Stanley Cup at the trade deadline, but Kelly, how much better is your team today than you were this time last week? Well, certainly we improved. The trade deadline is the last uh, opportunity that a manager has to uh, to help his team, to help the roster. So 
um, you know, we really like the three players that we uh, that we added. You've already uh, touched on it. You don't win the Stanley Cup at the uh, trade deadline. I know last year we you know, made a move for uh, Ivan Barbashev, who was uh, likely a little bit of an under-the-radar move. Teddy Bluger, Jonathan Quick were the guys that came in. And the team we played in the Stanley Cup Finals made no trades at the deadline. So there's a lot of hockey to be played out and a lot of, uh, you know, questions still be answered. But in terms of, uh, you know, our objectives going into the trade deadline, we were really happy to improve our team. Kelly, I think everyone was impressed what you guys did by adding Mantha and Noah Hannafin. And then you, you came with the King Daddy Topper and right at the, as the buzzer goes, uh, you add Thomas Hurdle to the group. Um, I mean, how did that deal kind of come about? Because he wasn't a name that anyone was talking about. No, we were able to, uh, you know, deal with San Jose for an extended period of time. And both organizations did a really good job of keeping uh, the discussions confidential. You know, obviously at a certain point, Thomas was involved as well as his representatives. But he was a player that we... uh, always had a lot of regard for playing against him. We had a fantastic rivalry with San Jose uh, in the first few years of, uh, of our existence. It hasn't been as much so uh, of late just based on, uh, you know, them going into a rebuild. And I guess, uh, you know, just in looking at, uh, you know, what they did with uh, Brett Burns, what they did with uh, Eric Carlson, uh, we thought it was worth pursuing. So that's sort of where the conversation started. There was a lot of layers to it in terms of, uh, the people that need to be involved, it's a big enough decision that, uh, you know, the president of their uh, hockey club had to be involved, their owner, because of the uh, financial piece uh, to this, uh, the player uh, himself, because Tomas had a full uh, no-move uh, clause in his contract. So it uh, was a process that took, uh, you know, the three trades we made, this was the one that uh, definitely took the longest in terms of the commitment of time and the and the. Uh, you know, different areas that had to be addressed. So, Kelly, we know you've taken uh, taken some heat for the way you've used the long-term injury reserve rules to your advantage here in being able to make the cap room to acquire these players. And and I know you've hit back and said, hey, this is, this is not something we've planned. You know, Mark Stone has a lacerated spleen, and we can't exactly predict the timing of that injury, and, and that's fair enough. But do you think that, you know, these rules need to be looked at when it comes to the league level because it is, you know, people do raise eyebrows that, hey, you know, Kucherov didn't play all season and suddenly he's ready for game one of a playoff and, you know, Tampa goes on to win a Stanley Cup. It does seem like a loophole that's being used here. Does does that loophole need to be closed in your mind or how do you see it? Uh, differently. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't feel that, that people are uh, – you know, disappointed with uh, with what we did. I think they're disappointed with the rule uh, that lets it happen. And, and I guess, you know, just sort of a few observations. Um, you know, we've had the most injuries in the NHL the last three years. Uh, you know, the last uh, two years, Mark Stone has been, uh, you know, in two unrelated uh, injuries, has, uh, has missed the final, uh, you know, three months of our season. So, we're playing without our captain, who's uh, the heart and soul of our hockey club. That is, uh, you know, clearly uh, making it more challenging for our team. The rules are designed so that if you lose a player for, uh, you know, in excess of uh, 10 games, 24 days, you can put him on to long-term, uh, long-term injury and replace that player. You have to always be cap compliant, which uh, in our case, um, you know, Shea Theodore missed, uh, I believe, 35 or 38 games, but because it was during the season, it wasn't that we were you know, able to go in and, and replace that player uh, because we knew Shea would eventually be coming back on our cap. Jack Eichel missed, uh, missed 20 games and, uh, and seven or eight weeks of uh, hockey, but again, we knew that he was coming back. In Mark's situation, uh, with the lacerated spleen, which is uh, currently why he's out of the lineup, it's a little bit different uh, in that we don't know when he's coming back other than we, either than, other than we know it's uh, not going to be for, uh, for some time. So that's why uh, the, the possibility of, of uh, you know, replacing him was there for us. And then I guess with that, uh, it's, uh, you know, doing our jobs well to, uh, uh, to take advantage of that. And, and I think, 
uh, you know, I would say to you that uh, we played 22 Stanley Cup playoff games last year in winning the Stanley Cup. Uh, we never had a salary cap over uh, over 82.5 million the entire playoffs uh, last year. So this wasn't a case where uh, we were operating with a 95 million dollar uh, payroll. I think the other thing too that uh, um, is worth mentioning, um, you know, to, to the, the the collective bargaining agreement is is where uh, these rules come from. So it's collectively bargained. It's between the players' association and the and the NHL. This isn't this isn't something that uh, next week at the general managers' meetings we can uh, have a vote and change. It's uh, it's collectively bargained. So it isn't going to uh, change. And I think that uh, the other thing that's really happened with the pandemic, with the flat cap. Uh, more and more teams have used LTIR. I believe there was 16 to 18 teams this year that went into uh, LTIR. Uh, you know, right where you guys are with uh, with the Leafs, I believe uh, have uh, you know utilized it uh, quite extensively. But also the trades you see with uh, you know just this past uh, uh, trade deadline. You know, anytime players get traded with. Uh, Fifty uh, percent of the salary being retained by the trading club, or the player going through a broker, which uh, uh, happens more and more. Um, that player ends up on uh, his final destination at a cap hit of twenty-five percent. Uh, fans don't seem to have a problem with that, and yet you can take a, you know, you can take a six million dollar player and and uh, you know put him on your lineup, you know, for just over a million dollars if you do it that way. So. Those are those are teams that are being creative to try to put the best uh, team on the ice that they can. No, no, no one broke any rules to do uh, retain transaction or to use a broker. They're using the rules that we have in place to try to do the best job they can for their hockey team. This, this is another example of that. Kelly McCrimmon is our guest, the Golden Knights general manager. Uh, Kelly, I'm curious, considering how much activity there was out West with all of the top teams seemingly making significant transactions, how much of your aggressive approach was a result of some of your top competition being very aggressive as well? Uh, Absolutely none, uh, to be honest. I I think that uh, uh, really what you saw this year was the reversal from last year, last year there were so many trades, and a lot of the uh, uh, players being moved, a lot of top players being moved, were all going east. There was an Eastern Conference uh, arms race uh, this year. You know, I, I think when when you look at the the teams on the western side, there's some really really good teams. So um, wasn't surprised at all that uh, teams did try to strengthen themselves, but. I don't think, uh, uh, you know, I, to be honest with you, I don't think likely for any of the teams that they were making their moves uh, because other teams in their division or in the conference were making their moves. I think you make the moves to try to make uh, your team better and then what goes on around you is uh, is out of your control. So in our case, uh, we would have done, you know, we, we would have, you know, exercised the exact same strategy whether we, uh, whether our teams in the West were, uh, adding players or uh, or whether they weren't. weren't. Kelly, I, I got one more for you, and, and it's it's interesting because draft and develop is typically what a lot of you know general managers preach and how to build a hockey team. And you've kind of proven that that's not necessarily you know the only way to win. Uh, I was looking at outside of Brendan Brisson, every single either draft pick or player you've picked to, in the first round, you've dealt away. Just curious what your thought process is on that and why. You know, you're not afraid to move on from those top picks or uh, those talented young players. Well, we're not afraid to move on from them, but, uh, you know, I guess a couple of things. We've got a great amateur staff with uh, Bob Lowe's and his uh, staff that have drafted some good players uh, for us that we've been able to uh, include in trades to make our team better and as well uh, some players that I think are developing really nicely uh, now on our team. We've got... uh, uh, more drafted players on our team now than we did a year ago, and I think that we we feel we've got some uh, some more coming. So uh, they've uh, been a big part of this. When we have traded first round picks or players that we selected in the first round, we've only done it at a time where 
we felt that the value we uh, util- uh, re- you know, realized from trading that pick was greater than what we were uh, trading away. So that's a little bit where you're at with your life cycle as a team. Um, you know, I've made the comment in other interviews, we don't do this recklessly. When we came into the trade deadline this year, for the next three years, we only had two picks uh, out of our draft grid, a fourth-round pick uh, this coming year that we used for Aiden Hill, a seventh-round pick for this coming year that we used for Jonathan Quick. Uh, besides that, we had every other draft choice for the next three years. Uh, we had last year's first-rounder, which uh, is rare for a Stanley Cup champion to have a first-round pick. We selected David Edstrom, which was the key, uh, the key piece of the deal uh, with San Jose that allowed us to acquire Thomas Hurdle. So when you, when you look at you know, we we only we only try to make those decisions if we feel we're going to put a player into our organization for an extended period of time. So last year, we uh, traded Zach Dean, another good draft choice by our amateur staff that uh, was selected in the first round, uh, played on Canada's World Junior Team, I believe, is making his NHL debut tonight. Uh, we traded him for Ivan Barbashev. We're going to have Ivan on our team for a minimum of six years. His uh, you know where he was at in his career lined up with uh, what we were trying to do in terms of uh, in terms of winning, and you know that's a that's a trade that works out I think real well for uh, for uh, everybody involved. So that's uh, sort of the rationale I think that we've used. I, I always uh, mention Tampa as another organization that I think have looked at things uh, differently and uh, had tremendous success uh, as a result. And and again, not speaking for Tampa, but uh, they've done such a great job of drafting as well. So uh, that's uh, you know those are all things that go into the decision. And again, uh, uh, you know I mentioned it yesterday. Uh, you know, regardless of what your strategy is, you need to make good decisions. And I think that uh, you know, we feel we're doing that. Well, Kelly, on behalf of everybody here at TSN, we appreciate your hard work because we're in the NHL content game here at TSN, and you and the Golden Knights provide a ton of just that. We thank you for your time. Best of luck the rest of the way. Thanks a lot for having me, guys. Always. That is Kelly McCrimmon, the general manager of the Vegas Golden Knights, who is clearly very well prepared for the questions about the LTIR, the cap circumvention. Mm -hmm. And what my response, if I was Kelly McCrimmon, I'd be like, Forget us. Look at Arizona, who yeah. currently has oh. Jake Voracek, Shea Weber, and Brian Little on their I- long-term IR for more than $23 million it's against crazy. the cap. It's so, crazy. listen, if you want to be critical of the Golden Knights or Tampa with Kucherov or Chicago with Kane, go ahead and be critical. But that, in my opinion, what these teams are trying to do, which is to win, not to be cheap, but to yeah. win, is far more egregious than what's going on oh, I in Vegas. One thousand percent agree. And uh, I remember this came up where it was, I think it was in the neighborhood of like forty-eight million dollars of their salary cap last season was allocated to players not on their roster, not on yeah. their roster. They only had like what the players who went on the ice was like thirteen million dollars in cap space. It was absurd. I mean, you talk about having a, a floor and a ceiling. It's it's for a reason. And that is far more egregious to be tanking in oh, that way sure. and just have the lowest amount possible is is absurd. No, let's face it. The only people that are complaining about this are the owners that don't want to spend the extra money, that don't want to turn it into a, a league where, yeah, you could run $100 bucks on a playoff salary cap because you've got 20 or whatever on your LTIR. Those teams don't want to pay. They don't, it's, it's essentially, and it's one of the Leafs' few advantages. Like, they don't mind paying. They don't mind throwing money at every problem they've ever had. And it's the one advantage they have over a lot of these teams that don't want to get into that types of, of, of financial arms race. So, you know, for me, I have no sympathy for those teams. I will say this, though. Like, when you look at the two, like the Leafs and, and, and Vegas, the guys that Vegas has on LTIR, they are going to be returning. You look at the guys that have been on LTIR for Toronto – those guys are typically done. Dude, Matt Murray right. is coming back, stealing the net, and taking the Maple hey. Leafs on a long playoff. Yeah. He's run. been he's been taking shots from Nick Robertson. <laughs> there you it's go. Nick, it's Nick Robertson and, and Matt Murray in the workouts <laughs> with Haley Wickenheiser and Patrick O'Sullivan, baby. That's where that's where the greatness is going to be found this playoffs. So Mike Johnson's going to join us in just over 20 minutes. We'll get into the breaking news just moments ago. The Matt Rempe suspension is in. What is it? We'll tell you next. 
Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. It's Karolnik, Feschuk, and DeStefano with you on this Tuesday afternoon. We've been waiting for the results of the phone hearing for Matt Rempe, who seems to be in the news every week for something else. Last week, it was his destruction of Ilya Labushkin, the fight with Ryan Reeves. Yep. Of course, the hit on Nate Bastion a few weeks ago against New Jersey, which in many respects is part of the story from last night where Rempe, a, a chicken wing elbow to the grill of Jonas Siegenthaler, an obvious suspension immediately. He gets kicked out of the game. Yeah. The result coming in that he was suspended for four games for the elbow. And I don't know if that's going to do anything for the bloodthirst of Curtis McDermott of the New Jersey Devils, who was actually acquired just a few days after Rempe destroyed Bastion yes. in that game in late February, which is like one of the bigger hits you'll see. Rempe is a big boy, and he hits like a truck. I don't know why, like we're watching it on TSN 2, and why the refs didn't allow McDermott to... To drop him with Rempe? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. And I talked to a, cu- to a couple of him. former National Hockey League players today who both said McDermott is the toughest player in the NHL right now. I've heard that too. He is a... I, one, Tough use dude. the term, he... Eats Nailed. glass for breakfast. Yeah, seems that which way. Which is probably the toughest thing and, one could do. And it's probably best for Mr. <laughs> Rempe that he wasn't unleashed on it. Because Rempe, let's face it, like it's hard to do what he has done when you play five minutes a night. Like He's, he's the story of I, almost I, every game he plays. I don't know wild. if I've ever seen a player who's got 10 games of NHL experience, plays five minutes a night, but has been the, the headline maker in the <laughs> world's, you know, North America's biggest city. Since he arrived. Last weekend, it was Leafs-Rangers. Original six matchup. Two teams destined for the playoffs. You've got star power. Panarin, Matthews, Marner, Nylander. Who? People wanted to see Reeves <laughs> versus Rempe. Yeah. That's what they got there for. And when they finally had it, everyone stood up and gave a nice loud cheer. Wow. That's what people care I think about. That's, you know, that's an interesting story. Because, I mean, I, I was I remember talking to Wendell Clark a while back. And, and he was saying that, you know, the over, he goes to all these appearances and card shows and, and talks to fans. And the one thing he was telling me is like, the one thing people say again and again and again is they miss the fights. Yeah. They miss the violence. They miss hockey like it used to be. And we haven't seen hockey like it used to be for quite a few years. And now Rempe rolls into town and suddenly there's like this resurgence of the enforcer culture and people were thirsting for it. Let's face it. And problem with Rempe is that, He's not that good an enforcer. Well, he's, he's getting, 21 he's years old, right? Like, yeah. He's got a glass jaw. He leads with it. And it's not looking like you worry about this kid's longevity here. Like, I, I think there's, I've heard a lot of ex-players and I've talked to a few ex-enforcers about this. And they're, they're literally saying like, someone needs to call this kid up and say, yeah. you're not doing it right, buddy. So I, I agree with that day, but at the same time, I mean, there's been a number of very questionable hits that he's laid. I mean, the bastion hit. And he got a match penalty for it, so he didn't get, did not get suspended, but you can make an argument he should have been. The Labushkin hit where it was a clear charge where the official somehow missed it. He was running from halfway across yeah. the ice and just destroyed Labushkin. Feet. And then last night, which he, of course, was suspended four games for, for the chicken wing elbow on Siegenthaler, that's clearly a dirty play. So there's yeah. at least three incidents where, I mean, Rempe could have, you could argue, supplemental discipline would have been in line for all three. But I do look at the number, four games. Well, and there, there was an example earlier this season, Connor Clifton, virtually identical play on, I believe it was Nico Heischer. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the chicken wing elbow comes up yeah. and you wonder Rempe for all the stuff that hasn't been subject to discipline. The plays that I mentioned, they're just like, you know what, let's take Packing a couple on. games onto this guy just so we'll send a real message. But I, I was surprised to see four. I thought three max. I even thought two was most okay. likely simply yeah. because of precedent, but, but you he, being, he technically has no player safety history. Well, you being a betting man, though, like how successful have you been at betting on the decisions you know, of Mr. Perro? Or, or just and anything. Not, yeah, or just anything. Yeah. The I mean, is, there's, there's, there's no rhyme or reason to any of it. Yeah, and, and I know because I, I think what you say has merit to it, where Thank it's, you. yeah, they probably should have maybe got a game or two for these other hits that we didn't give to him. Let's just tack it on and make it four. Because that was with you. We talked about it earlier. You're like, how many how many games? They said, ah, two, three, I, I guess. And then it ends up coming in at four. The thing is, though, like, the player safety, when the video comes out, they're going to have to explain how they came to four. 
So I, I'll be curious once this video comes out how they got to that number. Yep. Our intrepid yeah. television producer Joe from the Bridge is suggesting the Brendan Gallagher suspension where he received five games. Yeah, is but Gallagher a has a long history. Well, I, I think that's exactly it. He but has a track hit. record. Similar flying elbow. It's funny, like Rempe has been in the NHL for a couple of months now, has no track record with player Not safety, even. but he really <laughs> does. Like, well, like, you know, player safety is keeping very close tabs on Rempe because every night, and listen, there's a lot of people who are arguing, well, Rempe's six foot eight. It's not his fault that. Oh, he put it. He I, got his elbow oh, out. There. I completely agree. The same with, Le, with the Labouche get hit, and the same with Bastion hit. Yeah, those were all hits to the head. And now, what's coming home to roost for Rempe is a suspension. Now, is it too harsh? You can make the argument either way, but something was coming down for this clear hit to the jaw, and then what ensued afterwards. And you're right, McDermott wanted to fight. Why the refs didn't Should've allow that would have been one of the great deals but of all I, time. What I would say to those people who say, "Well, he's tall. Like, what's he gonna do?" You have to be in control of your body, your limbs, your stick. Like, that's part of the game. You have to be in control of it. And this is how you learn. It's going to cost him some money in his pocket. And next time, he's going to think twice if he wants to go in there and chicken wing a player in the jaw. Yeah, and I think Curtis McDermott's comments, which we'll play for you a little bit later in the show, represent kind of the old guard, the code of the National yeah. Hockey League. Rempe apparently did not answer that code. That's Mike DiStefano. That's Dave Festchuk. I am Aaron Karolnik. Our number two of Overdrive with Mike Johnson standing by is coming up on TSN 1050 and TSN 2.